By now, you have almost certainly heard about Ukraine's campaign against Russia's oil infrastructure. It became a recurring story at the start of the year, and seemingly as the Russian presidential election came onto the horizon, which is about right now on the timeline, Ukraine's pace absolutely exploded. Hence these animations are going so fast. But there is also something more subtle going on here. Although obtaining precise data on Russian trade flows is next to impossible at the moment, as a rough estimate, about half of Russia's oil export revenue comes from crude. That's the natural stuff that comes out of the ground. And the other half comes from refined products like gasoline. However, we should take a closer look at the earlier sequence of attacks. There is a commonality among all of those targets that Ukraine struck. The drones are only going after the finished products. None of the drones are targeting crude oil, even though anyone who was alive during the Persian Gulf War is acutely aware of how much damage can be done there. Ask yourself for a moment why it is all refined products and none of it is crude, and you might be able to speculate on some answers. And you would be right. But those more obvious explanations hide a more subtle reason. It is a clever strategy that Ukraine has adopted, and it draws some interesting parallels to what is going on over in the Black Sea. So today, we will go into the logic of those basic explanations, including the relative value of the oil, the concentrated targets that refineries represent, and the more advantageous geography. But then we will pivot to the subtlety of how Western economic sanctions have created a bottleneck so that the marginal value of an attack on crude oil may be close to zero, and that any additional sanctions or enforcement now will have a multiplier effect. Further, Russia's defensive strategy has not yet caught up here, so there is little reason to change the oil attack plan until Russia finds the right counter. Finally, we will conclude with how this draws an interesting parallel to what Ukraine has done on the Black Sea over the past year or so. But we begin with the point regarding the relative value between crude and refined oil. Given that one of those things is raw and the other is not, it will be unsurprising that one of them commands a superior price on a per-unit basis. Put simply, this one is better. Refining costs will vary based on the quality of the crude being processed and the refinery itself. But the price tag for refining a gallon of gasoline is something like 65 cents. Meanwhile, at the current price of crude, about $2 of value is in the raw stuff. Keep in mind that refining also produces a number of other products, like jet fuel. The $2 cited is the portion of it going to the gasoline production specifically. So refining adds some value, though perhaps not as much as you might think. Still, a value added of 33% or so is an extra 33%. Thus, all else equal, refined products are the better target. Indeed, the value differential reflects a broader labor problem for these guys, which ultimately becomes a problem for the state. If you destroy the production of crude at its source, the wasted labor and capital is just at that site. If you destroy refined products, there is still wasted labor and capital at that site, but there is also wasted labor from whoever pulled the crude out of the ground, and whoever transported it. Plus, you are also depreciating the capital at the site, and with the transport vehicles or infrastructure. The oil company is still on the hook for all of that, but does not get the fruits of the efforts. And for the broader economic picture in Russia, none of the benefits of the industry come until a Russian uses the oil for consumption, or it leaves the country at a high price. So this part is straightforward enough. The second basic answer is that Ukraine can perversely pass some of the effort of committing the attacks to Russia. Generally speaking, you have pockets of oil spread out across a given country. Each of those locations pumps crude oil out of the ground, but it does not just stay there. Rather, they ship the oil to a refinery for processing. Thus, if Ukraine hits one of the pump sites, it takes out that fraction of the oil. But if it holds off, and waits for the oil to be concentrated at the refinery, it can get the oil from multiple pump sites at once. If you have a limited number of drones, 
That is better than burning through an entire fleet to target every pump site. There is also a hint of double dipping here. If you destroy one of the pump sites, you may force the refinery to go idle for some time each day. As illustrated here, the refinery drops to 80% capacity. So you waste about 5 hours of their time, but that's about it. This is because the strike only hits the one pump site, and there are no indirect effects on the other pump sites. In contrast, you hit the refinery, and all of the pump sites no longer have their usual outlet. Normally, you would just send the oil elsewhere, but these are not normal times. Hold that thought for a minute. The third basic component of Ukraine's game plan is the geographic factor. No doubt about it, Russia is a big place. But more than half of its crude production comes from West Siberia, and just under another quarter of it comes through the Volga-Urals region. The reason is, as powerful as the Kremlin is domestically, they just have not been able to change the location of where Plankton decided to die millions of years ago. The crude oil is where it is, so if you want it, you have to make the pilgrimage out to the Plankton Cemetery. But once a barrel is out of the ground, you do have control over where it goes. It turns out that convincing people to work in the refining industry is much easier when the refineries are in places where more people want to live. Western Siberia is obviously a beautiful place to visit, but it is hard to convince someone with a generically high earnings potential to permanently live there. This is basically the North Dakota problem that US companies have. The GDP per capita there falls between California and Connecticut, and it's all because of a wage premium to convince oil workers to stay there. So if it is possible to shift locations, you might save a ton of money. As a result, Russia's refineries tended to drift west, which is convenient because that is also where the bulk of end consumers are. Inconveniently for Russia, however, the hiring economics also meant that Russia's refineries tended to be closer to Ukraine. Shorter flight times mean fewer opportunities for Russia to intercept the drones, and yet another reason for Ukraine to target refineries instead of crude sites. Okay, that is the basic stuff. Now I want to pivot to the interesting facet of Ukraine's strategy, and why I wanted to make this video. The bottleneck from sanctions and ships. Let's go back to that abstraction of crude oil and refineries. It turns out that Russia has way, way more crude oil than refineries to process it. You can blame those silly plankton for dying in a country whose relative advantage was not in the technical field of refining. So some crude barrels were staying domestic, but a whole bunch of them were being shipped abroad. Way back when, it was the economically savvy thing to do in a world with open markets. But then Russia invaded Ukraine, and many Western countries began turning away Russian crude. This is why you hear so much about India and China picking up the slack. However, the problem here is that the world has only so many tankers. Put simply, the market was not designed to accommodate Russia dispersing oil all over the world, and then for many of those locations to want to disperse refined oil elsewhere. To make matters worse, we have a confluence of disruptions to shipping. Drought limiting the number of ships that can cross through the Panama Canal, and Houthi drones cutting the Suez Canal's traffic in half. Now, it is hard to get confirmation of any of this, and we can thank the fog of war for that. Nevertheless, it appears right now that the main bottleneck that Russia is facing with its oil industry is in shipping the crude. Side note here. This is why we should be skeptical of any suggestions that Russia is somehow behind the Houthi attacks, even if we have discussed before how Russia's influx of cash to Iran has made increased support to the Houthis feasible. But that is a negative side effect of the purchase of drones, not a benefit to Moscow. Anyway, the last important piece of the puzzle here is the price cap imposed by the West. Although Russia has managed to consistently sell crude above the cap since the summer of 2023, 
The whole process is allowing its partners to negotiate below market prices. At the time of writing, the spread was about $15, much higher than the dollar or two it was back during those happier days of January 2022. Returning to the present, we have a world of crunched shipping and deflated prices. The consequence is that either Russia is leaving some of its crude pumps idle, or it is not profiting as much on what it takes to the market. Russia will try hard to stick with the latter option, even if it means operating at a small loss, because merely restarting a pump is expensive, and it is possible that the deposit itself may be damaged by stopping the flow, even for a moment. But at some point, Russia might not have a choice. Now put yourself in Ukraine's shoes. If you send a drone at a pump, what happens? Well, now that this one is gone, if Russia was leaving this one idle, all you end up doing is just getting that one to fire back up. There is capital damage, of course, and presumably Russia's marginal cost of extraction for the destroyed pump was lower than the one that was idle. But you are not harming production in any meaningful way here. Now compare that to what happens if you shut down a refinery. There is nowhere for that crude to go, so Russia ends up shutting down the pumps as well. In contrast, you target the pumps, and you do almost nothing. Put differently, by targeting the refineries, you kill two birds with one stone. Now, that being said, a big difference between birds and refineries is that once a bird is dead, it is dead. Machines, in contrast, normally can be repaired. But, as we discussed recently, the severing of ties to Western oil companies has likely left Russia with an inability to do that as well. So if repairs will happen, they will happen slowly. Before wrapping up, I want to zoom out and discuss a little more about what this means for the broader strategy of the war, beginning with further sanctions. And I should keep this short because I ought to dedicate a full video on the subject. To put it generously, there are mixed feelings in the White House about Ukraine's refinery attacks. Oil prices are on the rise, and the leading market theory is that this is a consequence of reduced supplies coming from Russia. Although the United States is now a net oil exporter, meaning that, in theory, higher prices should mean more money coming into America, the average American voter is worse off because the extra wealth is concentrated into the hands of oil companies, and I know that this is a shock, upsetting voters is bad news during an election season. This is particularly important because lower oil prices have cooled inflation, and indeed March's numbers jumped. However, any additional pressure on Russia's oil industry at the moment, either through stricter enforcement of the price cap, or by cutting down on Russia's shadow fleet, means that another well needs to be taken offline. In other words, when it comes to sanctions, Washington receives the greatest return on investment right now, though predictably, the United States has formally asked Ukraine to stop the attacks. Second, the absence of an effective Russian defense thus far means that there is little reason for Ukraine to stop the strategy. We have talked before about the optimal way for a country to allocate its defenses, back when Russia was preparing for Ukraine's summer 2023 offensive. Here is the basic idea behind the math. Imagine that you have a wide variety of weak points, each with its own amount of potential damage. Then you should begin assigning your defensive resources to your biggest vulnerability until the danger there matches the second biggest vulnerability. Then you allocate more resources between those two until they equate with the third biggest vulnerability. Then you allocate more resources among those three until they equate with the fourth, and so forth. In the context of the oil situation, with refineries being more vulnerable, Russia should be allocating the defenses there and not to the pump sites. Now, it goes without saying that a keyboard warrior such as myself does not actually see what Russia is doing with its defenses. But given how Ukraine keeps racking up the successes with refineries, it is clear that Russia is still nowhere near evening out the dangers, even as the Kremlin has started moving anti-aircraft systems to the facilities. In turn, 
Ukraine has no reason to change up its strategy until Russia makes the adjustment. I realize that is obvious and not some sort of brilliant insight, but it is worth describing what needs to happen with Russia's defenses before that changes. Finally, there is a nice parallel to draw with Ukraine's Black Sea strategy. If I asked you what two things that Ukraine is currently doing best, you would probably point away from the ground game and toward the refineries and toward the Black Sea. The latter, of course, is the result of sunken ships and a Russian fleet staying away from the sea's western section. The thing that these two fronts have in common is fixed limits. With the ground war, when a Russian soldier is incapacitated, Russia can rapidly find a replacement, more or less. There will be some long-run political consequences in Moscow, to be sure. But the point is that the pool is large. With oil, export opportunities are comparatively limited, so destroying refineries leaves Russia without a clear substitution strategy. But this type of problem is most acute on the Black Sea. The Montreux Convention, named for the Swiss city in which it was signed, prohibits warships from passing through the Bosporus Strait in times of combat, and Turkey is making good on its enforcement right now. As a result, what Russia has in the Black Sea is what Russia will have in the Black Sea, more or less. And Ukraine has excelled in ticking down the counter of irreplaceable ships. Another thing that is irreplaceable is knowledge, and in particular the knowledge that you will gain from reading my books about the war. Check the video description for more information on them. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And I will see you next time. Take care.